Okay, welcome to the webinar. It's Rick Silva. My goal for this webinar, and I think most of you were referred by Eric Lawholm. We'll talk about uh, my relationship with him shortly. Uh, my goal for this is to make you say things like, he's crazy. I've never heard that before. That's not what my CPA says. That's not what my financial planner told me. And I'm going to let you know most of what I'm going to teach you today, I've either done personally or some very wealthy people have taught me. So one of the, 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 the big keys throughout this webinar is going to be find people more successful than you and listen to them. As a general rule, not always, some of you, there might be some financial planners or some CPAs on here. <clears throat> As a general rule, not always. Now, I've had the chance to talk to maybe three or 400 CPAs and thousands of financial planners. I don't, don't want anybody to say, well, that's not, that's not, not all of them. Most financial planners and CPAs make between fifty dollars and $125,000 a year. And if that's what you want to earn, if you don't earn that now, that's fantastic. Then you might want to listen to them. But when you have a chance to listen to somebody who's made many, many times over 100000 in a month and whose mentors uh, make many times more than that, you might want to listen. It could be things you haven't heard before, um, and that's my goal is to tell you things you haven't heard before, just to, think of, to look at things differently. Okay, so Zero to Millionaire. Um, you're going to get a lot more than seven principles, but you have to you have to name the webinar something, and it's a catchy phrase. Seven principles I use to become financially free. You're going to get a lot more than that today. So our two outcomes for today: number one, to share with you, take the seven off, and say tons of principles that help change my financial life. And then, if you're interested, the other thing that I do: not only do I teach networking and have courses and all that, which I'm not going to talk about at all today. Uh, the way I created most of my wealth is partnering with my wife six years ago, helping people invest in land. I'll show you visuals of that. Uh, at the end, I actually am going through a huge offer on one of my parcels right now. I'm currently negotiating with uh, developers, and I'm going to show you the numbers and sh just show you the percentages, everything. So that will be at the very end if you're interested uh, in seeing that. I already said I have nothing to sell today. I'm just going to teach you a bunch of stuff. So let's get right into it. Enough about the preamble. Okay, so we have some rules. Now, some of you know I run networking groups. I've been running networking groups for the last 14 years. You always have to have ground rules for your meeting. Now, I can't control what you guys do, but you're going to spend an hour with me. You might as well uh, look at the third one and say, just kick back, relax, and listen. Number four, stay off your phone if you can. It's just an hour. It's just an hour. Have fun. We'll go to the top two. It's there. There's no such thing as a get rich, rich quick plan. Uh, this has taken me. Um, I'm going to tell you some things now. So when I pull up the slides, I'm going to skip it. So in 1998, I was with Eastman Kodak. I got laid off. I became a recruiter. I was a headhunter from 1998 to 2001. 29 years old, I was a multimillionaire in stock options with all these companies, and you know what happened to me in 2001, the dot-com crash, I lost everything. <clears throat> I got married, I had a house. In 2008, I got divorced. That house, uh, because of the bank-owned properties that were being released, that house went $300,000 under market, and I did a deed of trust transfer, and I handed it to my ex-wife. Um, and then... I was living in an apartment for for a couple of years, and in that time, if your income went from fifteen thousand a month at the time to six thousand a month because the economy took a dump, and you had to go rent an apartment, and pay two thousand a month in child support, I don't know how long you could live on your credit cards. I lasted about six months, and I was bankrupt. So in two thousand nine, bankrupt. Around that time, my roommate decides to buy a house. Now I have no place to live. I created my first audio course. It's a webinar-based audio course. <clears throat> I pre-sold it. I made $10,000 in about 45 minutes. I rented an office. I bought a futon. I put all my clothes in that office because it had some closets, put everything else I owned in storage. I lived in my office for six months, so I was homeless. I showered at the gym. 
Then my now wife, <clears throat> Marcella, joined one of my networking groups. She said she helps people invest in land. I didn't think anything of it. About a year later, I met the owners of the company, and I decided there was something there, and I went on to become a multimillionaire in six years. There's a lot more to the story than that. But there's no such thing as getting rich quick. I worked 80 hours a week for 13 years to where now the last two, I don't work over 15 hours a week, and my income's like 10 times what it was. And then the second one down, it's it's I'm a networker, but the, the funny line is it's network, not net lazy. You got to put in the work. So one more thing before we jump off of this slide. If information was all you needed, how come you've never met a billionaire librarian? Uh, Brian Tracy, that's one of his sayings, and I love it. If if information was all you needed, how come you've never met a billionaire librarian? You got to take the information, and then you got to do something with it. Eric always says, "Take massive action." You got to do something with it. I think it's 13 years at this point that I've known Eric. Um, <clears throat> I went to one of his seminars years and years ago, and then I became a protege of his. His $5,000 course, <clears throat> I'm 48 now. I think I was around, <clears throat> let's say 40, 41 maybe. I had to borrow the five grand off my mom. 41 years old, I'm borrowing five grand off my mom to join the program. From that uh, coaching, I didn't go to him for sales training. I went to him for systems and how to create courses. And then I launched my course, and the, the rest is kind of history from there. Um, when you have a mentor, any mentor you have that in return after years gives what I got to put at the bottom, that's an honor right there. Rick Silva is one of my mentors. I'm excited to have all of you meet him and be introduced to some of his ideas on wealth building. That's from Eric. That's pretty cool when a guy that's training you uh, one day calls you on the phone and the table's reversed. It's very cool. All right. <clears throat> So a little bit more detail on my, my background without telling you the, the um, literally rags to riches to rags to riches story. Uh, I worked for Eastman Kodak, then I was a recruiter, and then I did staffing for startups. That's where I got all the stock options. Um, I have two webinar-based courses on networking, 2008, 2009, bankrupt, certainly not bankrupt anymore. I've listened to over 8,000 hours of audio courses in my car. And I've read somewhere between, I'm going to say between six and 800 books. So I just said 700. And I think the 8,000 hours, honestly, now is probably nine or 10,000 hours. Again, I was a recruiter, got divorced. I told you this story already. The bottom two are the key um, to think about. So <clears throat> when I was raised, my family did houses and stocks. And that, there's a good chance that that's how you were raised, houses and stocks. Um, but historically, the greatest uh, fortunes in the world have been created with land, and I'll show you some visual of that later. So not only do I teach networking and run networking groups, and I also help people diversify into land. Here are the seven principles with a whole bunch of inside, a whole bunch of principles inside of it. Number one, the ego hat, the ego hat. Number two, investor versus speculator. Number three, some ideas on not over leveraging. Uh, number four, some ideas on power partnering. If you have a job, you can take a nap through power partnering. If you're self-employed, you might want to listen closely. And then we're going to talk about 401ks. We're going to talk about the missing link in investing, and we're going to just get some ideas on finding people to listen to besides potentially the people you're listening to now. So the ego hat. So here's Rick Silva standing on stage. Coming off stage, signing autographs, selling audio courses, shared the stage with Les Brown years ago. I walk into the office uh, of the owners of the company that helps people invest in land. That's where my wife had been working for years. I sit down. The owner of the company looks at me and he goes, I know in your world you're a big deal. I got it. I know. You're a big deal. And if you come in here... Thinking you're a big deal, I can't make you rich. So what I want you to do when you walk in our office is take that 10-gallon ego hat off and hang it at the door. If you can take the ego hat off, I can make you rich. If you're going to keep the ego hat on and think you know everything, then you're going to be exactly where you are. <clears throat> and I said, I go, heck, I'll take the 10-gallon ego hat off. I'll, I'll, I'll lay here naked. 
Um, so when I'm around those guys, I have zero uh, ego. I, I, I just take it in anything they say, I listen. I just listen, 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 listen. So a lot of times when I'm doing classes or networking, people go, boy, I know everything about networking. I hand out my business cards everywhere I go. Uh, that's not networking. That's called marketing. So I have to then go into this whole thing about you know, what networking is and they think they know everything and I can't teach you anything about networking if you think you know everything. For me to learn how to create wealth in land, I had to go into it uh, saying, I don't know anything and I'm just going to listen. I'm asking you guys, is there's a possibility that you went on this webinar thinking you know a lot. I'm asking you for the next 50 minutes, let's pretend that Rick Silva might know something and let's just, maybe I got something to, to give you and if the ego wall is too thick, the message won't get through. Okay, so my what I learned, what made one of the things that made me wealthy was you got to take the ego hat off when you get around people that might know more than you and just understand none of us know everything. Next slide. Find mentors. Okay, so I'll tell you one quick story that my cousin saw me do and he couldn't believe it. I would, if I was in a coffee shop. And I saw somebody pull up in a Bentley or a Rolls Royce or an Aston Martin or a Porsche or a really high-end Mercedes. Once in a while, not every time, but once in a while, I would get in line and I'd say, excuse me, I, I saw you pull up in your, in your beautiful car. Can I ask you what you do? Because I always like talking to people more successful than me and maybe I can learn something. Now, some people are going to look at you like you're an alien. That's okay. One or two or three out of ten people are going to answer a bunch of questions for you, uh, and that's going to change your life. There's a book called Rich Like Them, Rich Like Them, and a guy went out, and he went to the richest uh, zip codes in the United States, and he would wait for the UPS driver to pull up to the gate, and then he'd walk through the gate, and he'd go, and he'd knock on every door of every mansion. And the person would answer the, if they answered the phone, he'd say, "Hi, I'm I'm interviewing rich people. Can you tell me what you did to get this house?" <laughs> he gave the number. How many people slammed the door in his face? Some people answered one or two questions. Some let him come in and and interview him and uh, with the servants serving him lunch. There are people that will answer your questions. Here's the key: you got to have the guts to ask them. Next slide. Again, I've already said it. I, I give you the slide so you can look at it later and so it can embed into your mind. You have got to find people more successful than you. There is someone in your industry, no matter what you do for a living, there is someone who makes 10 times more than you. Find them and see if they'll help you. <clears throat> so success leaves tracks. Uh, this, I'm going to explain to you what this means. Like walking in the snow, just walk in the same steps as they do. Uh, and, and steps and do what others have done. So here's the example. My wife's from New Mexico. My father-in-law is a pretty famous hunter, elk hunting, deer, all that stuff. The guy's 70 years old, and every year we go there for Christmas, and they hike up these mountains. <clears throat> there, no human being could keep up with my wife. I can't keep up with her father, and he's 70. So they lose me every time. But what I can do <clears throat> is walk in his tracks, and I will find him. So what I'm getting at is you need to find people more successful than you, walk in their tracks, and someday you'll be where they are. Okay? you got to have coaches. I can help you with networking. Eric Lawfolm with sales, and then uh, Brian Tracy, Bob Proctor, Zig Ziglar, Jim Rohn. Those are my guys. Those are the guys I've spent thousands and thousands and thousands of hours with, listening to in my car, watching them on YouTube. It's all out there. you just got to find it and get it. Let's talk about investors and speculators. So I've had the chance to meet with, again, probably well over a thousand, but certainly in the hundreds and hundreds of financial advisors, over a thousand real estate agents, at least three or four hundred mortgage lenders. So I've heard people talk about how they invest. I invest in this. I invest in that. And a lot of times people are trying to time it. They're trying to time it. What's the next hot this? What's the next hot that? And they're timing it. So the difference between an investor and a speculator, an investor buys an asset based on what it will do over time. Never buy anything you can't hold for 10 years. So if you're buying something going, it's got to go up quick. Oh, my God, what's the latest price? Don't even look at it. 
let it go. If you can't let it go, you shouldn't have invested in it in the first place. A speculator buys and sells on the movement of the price going up and down. This is a great slide that we found. You can see the stock market going up and down. The, the wife's having a heart attack. The guy's looking at his 401k is going to pass out. The dog's about to, about to have a heart attack because it's going up and down, up and down, up and down. That's not the life I lead. So in yellow on the screen, I'm waiting for – I can see your view. I was waiting for the screen to show up. So typically high-risk investments that are almost uh, akin to gambling fall under the umbrella of speculation, whereas lower-risk investments based on fundamentals and analysis fall into the category of investing. I'm giving you all this information. When I send you the recording, you can slow down and read the entire slide. Now, talking about over-leveraging, I, I knew so many people that before 2008, they'd buy a home. It'd go up 100000 in four or five months. They'd take the equity out. They'd buy two more homes. Those would go up. They'd take the equity out, and they had 20 homes in two or three years. And then in 2000, 2008 and nine, they lost all of those homes. So, And I, I know another person that was very successful. He bought a $2 million building that had three or four offices. Like, it was like a little commercial strip. The, the anchor of it was a Burger King. And his monthly nut on that building, I, I don't know the exact numbers. It was five figures. It was ten, fifteen, twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars a month that he was paying on that note. So what happened is the cousin was the bookkeeper for the Burger King, and he was stealing money. And that Burger King went under, and they, the, the franchise closed it on him. So now you have a building that was custom built with a Burger King in it and you lose the Burger King, there is no way he could afford that nut. So he lost the building. What I'm getting at is if you if you are investing in any kind of rental real estate and you don't have at least a year cash put away to cover that monthly nut, you're making a huge mistake. And I know a lot of people that, I've got to buy a house, I need cash flow. And then they got that extra two or $300 a month on cash flow and then they go buy a car with that money. And then it needs a washer dryer or it's got a leak or it needs a $15,000 roof and they've been blowing that cash flow. Most people I meet invest in cash flow so they can have a higher lifestyle now. You're not going to get wealthy. You're, you're not even going to get above lower middle class if you're spending your cash flow. And almost everyone I meet spends their cash flow to live on it. Humongous mistake. Please have a year liquid before you even dream of buying any investment that, that you think you're going to get cash flow on. Uh, it's a it's a risky endeavor. <clears throat> so I want you to always think about this. The reason we have stress is because we have debt. The reason we have stress is because we have debt. I'm not going to read this entire slide to you. It's called the wedge theory. You can see it on top. Brian Tracy teaches it. Now I want you to think back 10 years ago, 15 years ago. There's a chance you made less then than you do now, and you were still living when you were in college. You were still living. Uh, a couple years later, you got a job, and you were making a ton more money. You were still living, but you're making more now. But you may not have any more money now than you did then because what people do is their income goes up. So do their bills. What we need to do is we need to find a way to bring the income up and not let the bills chase us at the same speed. So the gap between what we earn – and what we spend, the bigger that gap is. I want you to imagine if you if you touched your palms together and then you opened up your fingers wider and wider, it looks like a wedge. And you need to drive a wedge between your income and your expenses or you will never, ever, ever retire. That's the bottom line. You've got to take that the gap between what you make and what you spend and you've got to find ways to invest it or you're going to work till the day you die. So here's some more cool stuff I learned from mentors. Top one. Uh, you got to learn how to outpace, outpace inflation. That's why I invest in land. At the end, I'll show you uh, the parcel that I have an offer on, and you'll see how it outpaces anything on the planet. <clears throat> Return on investment on creating audio courses. So when I created my first $197 course, I was doing the publishing, printing the CDs, putting it in the case. My hard cost on the course was around 20 bucks. So every time I sold the 20 $197 course, my pocket lost 20 bucks. So I was you know basically uh, nine times return on courses. 
now I have it on memory stick and the memory stick cost me three bucks. So it's 65 times return on my outlay. I don't have a website that has it virtually, but if you have a website that after you've paid the cost of the site, it's 100% profit. If you have knowledge in your mind, you want, might want to consider giving webinars like I am right now. This webinar is being recorded. I could package it and sell it. I put it on YouTube to drive uh, traffic to my YouTube page or to get me more exposure. I highly recommend creating courses. The next one is I hear a lot of people talk about owning precious metals. And I want to give you my input from uh, people that are much more wealthy than I. And th let me read this sentence and I'll explain it to you. Own gold, actual gold. Own gold bars, own gold. Gold is a horrible, horrible, horrible investment. Gold, But it says here gold's not a very good investment, but gold attracts more gold. So gold is it has a vibrational function in it. That's why people wear jewelry. It makes them feel good because it has a vibrational function in it. If you have gold coins and gold bars, it attracts more gold. But in itself is not a good investment if you're if you're buying it thinking it's going to go up a lot in value because it could also go down a lot in value. So gold is a commodity. If they were to start digging and they find a gold mine that's the greatest gold mine they ever found, gold will go down to 10 or 15 or 20 bucks an ounce in a second because it's a commodity and it's based on scarcity. It's also based on uh, if people like the Rockefellers and the Morgans want to release some from their vaults. They control the prices by doing that. So I want you to think if you had an ounce of gold at the day of Christ. Christ is 25 years old, and he's going to take an ounce of gold, and that ounce of gold is going to buy him a pair of shoes, a beautiful robe, and a nice belt. Today, an ounce of gold is barely, if even, going to buy a man or a woman a nice pair of shoes, a belt and a beautiful suit. I highly doubt you could do it with that. What I'm getting at is that investment has never in the history of the world and never will in the history of the world outpace inflation. It's never going to happen. It never will. It never has. It's not going to outpace inflation. You've got to outpace inflation. Inflation, You're never going to retire. <clears throat> if you want to be wealthy, we're looking at the next one. Why? What are you going to do with the money? That goes into goal setting. That goes into affirmations. you got to ask yourself, why do I want to be wealthy? Now, no matter what you invest in, you got to diversify. So me personally, uh, the only thing I own is land. I don't have a dollar in the stock market. If you gave me a stock, I'd sell it and buy more land. I own eight parcels of land. I control 1.1 million square feet of land, eight different areas in Southern California. Last one on the list, credit cards paid off at the end of the month. This is from my mentor. One of my mentors, if I can't pay it off at the end of the month, then I wait seven days to make the purchase to decide if I really need it. If I really need it, then I'll buy it only if I can pay it off in two months or less. If I can't, then I shouldn't buy it. This is uh, one of the big keys for how I got wealthy. Most people don't do this. People with jobs, it's virtually impossible to do this. This is why you might need to start a job on the side or a business on the side. If you're self-employed, you got to work towards doing this. Rick, I can't do one, one third taxes, one third lifestyle, one third wealth creation. Let me just reword it. One third is going to taxes. One third you are going to live on. One third is going strictly into investments, not to buying the next vacation, not buying the next car. It's for, it's for investments. So with this plan, my goal is 15 years, 25 to 30 million. That's my goal. I don't know what your goal is. Some people think a million dollars a lot. If that's a lot of money to you, cool. But you're not going to do it if you're spending everything you make. The next one down, I understand there's no prepayment penalty anymore, but there used to be. Don't worry about prepayment penalty. Just get the concept here. Buy a home with a 30-year mortgage, make the highest payments possible, and get it paid off as soon as you can. No matter what happens to my house, no matter what happens to me, my house can't be taken away, and I'll never be homeless. One of the things we need to do if we own our house outright, no matter what happens to our life, we're not going to be homeless, and if you ever need money when your house is paid off and you have the grant deed in your hand, you can very easily go to a bank and take some equity out if you need to. The bottom one, I could do a two-day seminar on the bottom one. Anybody ever tells you to do anything for a tax write-off, buy a house for a tax write-off, do this for a tax write-off, do that for a tax write-off, guaranteed they're poor or at best they're lower middle class. You're never going to hear a wealthy, wealthy person ever 
do anything ever for a tax write-off. So I mentioned something to one of my mentors. I said something about a tax. He goes, tax write-off. You guys want a tax write-off? Write me a check for a hundred grand. I'll, I'll have you seventy back. There's your tax. There's your tax write-off. People on their tax write-off, ninety-nine percent of the things they buy is a depreciating, depreciating asset, a, a, asset. So they wrote it off to save the thirty percent, but that thing depreciated seventy percent the day they bought it. So they're still losing. So. I'm going to read the paragraph now. Never concern myself with a tax write-off for my house or anything else. This is how the poor and middle class were raised, and it's not how rich people think. The stress of the house payment is more detrimental to my health, my health than the little tax write-off is to the bottom line. If people are thinking about these little tax write-offs, their minds grooved to save on taxes instead of creating wealth. This comes from my mentor. You might be leasing a car, and that's fine. I'm not telling anyone what to do. I'm just telling you what that was told. Don't ever lease a car because a car is debt. Pay off, pay, own a car and pay it off as soon as possible, cash if possible. Now, the thing about leasing a car, you'll see every lease you look at in the, in the, in the two font. It's so small you can't even read it. If you drive the car over 10 or 12 or even 15,000 miles in a year, you're going to pay 30 to 50 cents a mile every mile over that. I've met many, many, many people in my life that lease a car and then they park it in the garage because they hit their mileage limit. The fact that they're parking the garage because they know they're going to hit a mileage limit is stress. We're trying to eliminate stress because stress causes illness. Leasing a car causes stress. Stress causes illness. Middle paragraph, have a minimum of a 12 months cash re reserve in the bank. This is a direct quote from one of my mentors. My mentors, If I don't have that much in reserve, I feel more naked than I would if I was walking naked in the Mojave Desert. When I get it in, and this, was, this is mine basically, when I get a huge commission and or sell one of my parcels, then my goal is to pay the house off even quicker so I don't have the house debt. Now, I'm long past a lot of these concerns, but these are things that got me there have a massive umbrella policy because the difference between a $1 million policy and a $3 million policy per year is nothing. Look into getting an umbrella policy. Always remember feeling comfortable is the goal. The reason we have stress is because we have debt. I want you to think about why more, most marriages end. If, uh, if I had you write down the top 10 things on your mind right now, seven of them involve money. <clears throat> you want to get to the the time in your life where you write down 10 things and only maybe the bottom two or three have anything to do with money. Everything else is having fun. So if you have a job, this might not, you might not get this, but if you're self-employed, I want to talk to you about power partnering. It has a lot of different names. Most of you came from Eric. He calls it a POI. It's called a COI, it's called a POI, it's called a collaborative partner. If you're in corporate, it's called a business development partner or a channel partner. In the world of networking, it's called a power partner. No, none of those other terms are going to fly as much as a, the term power partner because most people know that. The definition of a power partner is there are other people in the world who already have your client. They call on, they sell to, and they serve the exact same people you do. So I'm going to give you the example of a financial planner, a real estate agent, and a banker. A power partner to a financial planner is a CPA because he's got clients, and when they, he finds out they need financial help, he refer the financial planner. So I'm just going to draw a picture for you here. Financial planners want to talk to CPAs and bankers. Bankers want to talk to CPAs, business attorneys. Real estate agents want to talk to home inspectors, mortgage lenders, financial planners, divorce attorneys. On and on and on. You need to look at your industry and then ask yourself, who else has that client that I could partner with? It's called leveraging. Uh, this is a 10-hour conversation. I created a whole course just on these next three or four slides. It's not doing it justice. But I'm going to tell you this, and you're going to think I'm nuts. I don't care what industry you're in. I don't care what you do for a living. I teach people how to never, under any circumstance, ever look for a client. If you're door knocking, if you're cold calling, if you're running advertisements, if you're doing SEO and PPC, all that says is you're not a networker. It's not good. It's not bad. But you don't have a referral practice built. I do not like leads. I don't work with leads. I, uh, leads are too much work. 
You have to learn how to be a good closer. You have to be learn how to be an unbelievably good salesperson with leads. When it's a referral, it's 95% closed before you even meet the person. That's what I like because I only want to work 10 or 15 hours a week. So professional networkers, let me go back to my slides. Professional networkers do not ever look for clients. They look for people who already have them. The major advantage of having a big giant network, and by the way, I didn't say this because this isn't a networking uh, webinar. I've had over 5,100 one-on-one -on -one coffee meetings. I built my entire practice never talking on the phone. I haven't made a phone call in 14 years. I don't use websites. I meet people. And I do things like this. Now, I didn't do any work. There was 91 of you registered for this webinar. I didn't do one second of work to get those people to register. Someone else did it. That's called power partnering. Um, but the major advantage of being highly networked is you have referrals coming to you without effort. It means, number one, you can spend more time serving your clients. Number two, you can spend more time not working. <laughs> That's why I only work about, at the most, 20 hours a week. So the average self-employed person spends 25 to 35 hours a week looking for clients. If, if you had all the clients coming to you you could handle, then you're just servicing them, and then you're hanging out doing other things. i got other things I like to do besides work. It's the single most important concept you must master. I can help you with it. I just can't help you with it today. If you need help with your networking, I can certainly help you just – Send me an email. My info is at the end of this webinar. I'm going to skip this because you're either going to be a networker or you're going to be a cold caller. So I'm going to skip these slides. We're going to talk about 401ks now. <clears throat> Man, I could do. There's so much to know about 401ks, and I'm so not a fan of them, and I don't believe in them in the slightest. I'm just going to show you some things that explain it. Again, 401ks are for reducing your tax base, all that. Remember, anything that helps you save on taxes is not going to make you rich. Let me show you a picture here. Look at that. Look at that house. Whoa, it's not even done. I think they're building tennis courts on the right. But that's a the, the pool house is bigger than most people's homes. The, where he parks his cars is bigger than 90% of the homes in the country. Here's another one. Look at that. I think that one's in the Ham in the, in the, in the Hamptons. And then look at that beast. And then look at that one. Guess what? Guess who owns them? Now, let me ask you a question. Do you think the people that own those have 401ks or are they the hedge fund managers? Go on the internet and look up homes of hedge fund managers. Those are the homes of hedge fund managers. All of you that have money in a 401k, you will not be wealthy from it. But the people that are charging you the secret fees behind the scenes that you could never figure out in your lifetime. They're the ones living in those mansions. They're getting rich off of you. You can't control anything that has anything to do with the fees that are being charged in those 401ks. I'll show you some more information on that shortly to give you an idea of how much I love 401ks. But what we want to look at is another way to get a million dollars. If you look at the screen, find your age. And whatever age you are, look at the dollar amount. And that's how much you need to save until you're 70 to have a million bucks, and that's if you think a million bucks is a lot of money. Unless you have a pension, you better have a heck of a lot. A million bucks is nothing. But if you're 35 years old, 850 a month for the next 35 years, I have a million bucks. Just look at your age, look at the number, and that's how much you need to have to get to a million. Again, and I keep saying this, that's if you think a million is a lot of money. If you don't have a, if you don't have a pension, whoa, let's prove it. So... And this is old. This is from uh, 2011. They used to say it was 4%. So what you do is you have your nest egg when you retire, and if you take out 4% per year – it's on the next slide. Let me show you. If you take out 4% per year, then you won't do something called superannuate. You guys want to hear a cool term. Superannuation means you dang sure better not outlive your money. Your out money better outlive you. But they changed it in 2012. They're saying now it's 1.8%. Actually, in 2010, 1.8%. So if you had a million bucks, you cannot take out more than $18,000 a year or you will superannuate, meaning you will outlive your money and you'll be broke. So if you look at this example on the screen, if you have 500000 bucks at 1.8%, that means when you retire, you cannot 
take out more than $9,000 a year. My medical insurance is $9,000 a year right now, and I'm 48 years old. I can't even fathom what it's going to be. What I'm getting at, guys, you got to have a million dollars is 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 nothing. It is nothing. I can help you get rich, but it's certainly not with a 401k. <laughs> so in yellow, the important decisions about your 401k are made by someone with no training or education in most companies. 90% of the country's employees' 401k plans are watched over by people who need no special qualifications. And I didn't make that up. November 9. Uh, November, I'm sorry, November 2009, smart money. Go down to the bottom. The impact of 401k fees is hidden and colossal. Many fees are not required to be disclosed to you, uh, and it can eat up more than half of your 401k income uh, that you earn in a 30-year span. And one of the other funny terms I, I hear a lot is my 401k only goes up when I put money in it. Yeah, because all you're doing is saving on taxes. It's not going to get you rich. A recent AARP study found that 80% of 401k plan participants were unaware of how much they were paying in fees. And if you don't know about it, you can't change it. More and more employees are investing their futures in 401k plans. People who participate in these plans assume the responsibility for their retirement income by contributing part of their salary in many instances and directing their own investments. That These people are not trained professionals. The hidden fees in retirement plans are confusing and the major problem for retirement savers. Tony Robbins' book, uh, uh, money master the game. He had some very high-end attorneys look at people's 401k plans, and they could not figure out uh, what the hidden fees were. <clears throat> Again, on the top, hidden fees and various backdoor payments you will never ever know about are costing Americans 17 billion dollars a year, and can reduce your overall retirement savings by 40 to 60 percent. And if you don't believe me, I want you to go back when you're if you have this on record or go on Google and type in hedge fund managers houses because that's the homes they live in because of the fees they're charging you. The missing leak in investing, this is how I have become wealthy. And that's land banking. It's what my wife did long before we met. She's 36. She started when she was 27. I started when I was 42-ish. And let's talk about it real quick. Who land is not for is those who do not have a long-term perspective, those who think cash flow is going to make them wealthy, and speculators who try to time the market. It's very rare you're going to find anybody wealthy who times the market. Who it is for people who don't like the volatility of the stock market and or they have rental properties and the four T's, tenants, toilets, termites, and trouble. Or people who have cash just sitting in the bank and they have no clue what to do with it. Those who don't like to be a landlord or business owners. I've met hundreds of business owners and the only thing they own is their business. And they go, oh, when I retire, I'll sell it for a million dollars. They're lucky if they're going to get a hundred grand for it. You'd be shocked what the true value of a company is. It's much lower than people think. And then they think they're going to retire on just that. And then the way people invest with us is if they have cash old 401ks or IRAs with $25,000 to $2 million, there's something called a self-directed IRA, and those can be opened, the money can be moved into that non-taxable event, and then the self-directed IRA can own land. What is land banking? The practice of buying affordable pre-developed land in the path of growth. For those of you like that are visual, this slide and the next slide made me a millionaire. If you get it, it can make you wealthy too, and I can help you do it. So in this picture, you see, you're going to see a whole bunch of yellow lines. And before I tell you what the yellow lines are, I want you to look in the upper right-hand corner, 2002, Rancho Cucamonga, Southern California. You're going to also see in the bottom left an on and off ramp that is not built. You're going to see these yellow lines. Google put those lines in showing you where the roads ended up. They are not there in this picture. If you had the knowledge, if you knew where the on and off ramp was going, if you knew how to acquire the land, you could get land in this picture for fifty to two hundred thousand an acre. Five zero, fifty to two hundred thousand an acre. I'm going to jump ahead ten years. This has happened in every area you live, where you live now, where you grew up. This has happened. But when you live there, you don't see it. I'm going to give you an aerial view. I want you to think anywhere you live and look at it uh, over the course of 10 or 15 years, and it's done that. In that picture is wealth. I promise you the people that own the land made way 
way, way more percentage wise than the people that built those buildings. I'm going to back up 50 to 150,000 an acre. In that picture, 2 million to 7 million per acre, 10 years later. That's a visual land banking is buy the land there, hold it. When the developers want to build, they're going to come knocking. I'm about to show you, I'm going through an offer on all my parcels, and I'm going to show you the wealth I've created for one of my parcels. All right. So we're coming to the conclusion here. We've got a little bit more to go. you got to be open to opportunities and just watch who you listen to. Please be careful who gives you advice. Very cool uh, saying one of my mentors heard when he was very young and broke in America. Everybody has a chance to become a millionaire. The problem is most people do not recognize the opportunity. Some of you might recognize an opportunity in me, and I might be able to help you, and my wife. I want you to always ask yourself, how much does my advisor earn? What's their net worth? What are they truly an expert in? You always want to ask yourself about the person or people that are advising you. <clears throat> okay, I have so many books that it's I can't even take pictures of my bookcases because they're packed. This is the best book I've ever read in my life. If you think Think and Grow Rich is good, I think this is better. So this is a word-forward interview between Napoleon Hill and Andrew Carnegie, at the time the richest man in the world. Most of Think and Grow Rich was was written off of interviews with Andrew Carnegie and Henry Ford. This is the word for word interview between Andrew Carnegie and Napoleon Hill. On Audible, it's called The Wisdom of Success by Andrew Carnegie. The book is called The Wisdom of Andrew Carnegie. They just have a different name. I don't know why, but they do. I cannot recommend enough. If you don't have Audible, you've got to run and get Audible. Nine bucks a month. I've downloaded $500 brain Tracy courses for nine bucks. This is on Audible. I can't recommend it enough. Uh, another one, uh, you guys have heard this, a rich dad, poor dad, but th this goes true for me. My dad always told me to work hard, work hard, work hard. You're not going to get rich working hard. You're going to get rich working, working smarter. Now, the last thought is this. I'm 48. If you're over 35 or 40, there's a very good chance your parents have a retirement plan, some form of a pension. We were all raised to do what our parents did, which is own stocks and houses or businesses. So I want you to think about this, okay? You taking your financial advice, not maybe not you, don't take it personally, but most people take financial advice from their family members. My father has a pension, $7,000 a month. My dad's got, and I'll give his total personal information, but he doesn't have that much money in the bank. He does not need to. He has a pension. Why would he need to have money banks out a pension? If you don't have a pension, you better have millions in the bank when you retire or you're never going to retire. That's the bottom line. There's no way around it. So you take advice and somebody has a pension. You're taking advice from the wrong person. Now, I want to show you this is why I can't sleep at night. I want to show you what I'm going through. With I have eight parcels. This is one of them. I'm going to go through this, and then I want you to, to be happy for me. If you don't like me, be happy. <laughs> so I bought a, uh, my wife and I bought a parcel in December of 2014, 1.84 acres in Southern California, $92,000. Okay, in December of 14, a dollar fifteen a foot, 92 grand. Six months later, I get an offer for $126,000. You can see on the bottom the rate of return. I don't need to, I don't need to uh, say it. You can see it. All right. So here's the actual parcel. That's my dirt. I own it. That's 1.84 acres. That's mine. Bottom right-hand corner. You can see up here some houses and some buildings, a housing tract here. And this building here would be one of the biggest buildings you've ever seen in your life. It's an eighth of a mile wide and a quarter mile long. That's a Whirlpool distribution center. You see some distribution centers over here. That's my parcel. Okay, then I get some maps sent to me, and then the developers are really trying to get the land for me, and they send me this map. I'm going to zoom in twice to show it to you. The Whirlpool Distribution Center is over here. This is my parcel right here. All right, you can see all these, all these squares. So the developer has to buy all of these squares to build this 1 million square foot building on my land. The water and the sewage is going right through my land. I'm right here. 
I, there's my parcel again, right there in the corner, right there. They're going to build the building right here. I get another offer, 365000 and this was in March. Now, developers do everything they can to steal the land, so this is still low ball. But you can see the rate of return on the bottom, and I still told them it wasn't enough. They sent me some more maps showing me what they're planning on building, and that's great because it just helped me with it, give me a stronger negotiating position. And then I get an offer for five hundred thousand dollars one month later. And there's you can see the rate of return on the bottom, and that certainly outpaces inflation. So I don't want to hear about investing in gold. And then I said, if you take the five off and change it to a six, you got a deal. Three weeks later, I got it. That offer came in a couple weeks ago. I'm negotiating a couple different um, terms on it, and then we'll be done. So I can help you invest in land if you're interested. My wife does the webinars. All you do is pop me an email. People that say things like, I want to diversify my portfolio. My 401k only goes up when I put money into it. I need to recoup money I lost in the downturn. Oh, my God, my investments are stressing me out. I'm sick of tenants, toilets, and termites. The stock market's too volatile. I need to do a 1031 exchange. Oh, my God, I don't know how I'm ever going to retire. If you're saying these types of things, I can help you. And this is basically kind of when I say if you qualify. So here's the thing. We do two webinars a month. My wife does them. They're an hour and 10 minutes long on, on land banking. My wife's one of the world-renowned experts on it. She teaches it. If you're interested in getting the link to those webinars, my email's on the bottom of the screen. Basically, to invest, you gotta have you gotta have it. I put thirty, but twenty-five grand, we can get you land with twenty-five grand. Anywhere from twenty-five thousand to two million dollars in cash or old IRAs, I can help you create wealth with land. I showed you just one of my parcels. We've helped many people do things like that. Guys, I hope you enjoyed the webinar. I'm going to stop the recording now. I'm going to leave my email on the screen. You can email me anytime you'd like. I hope you enjoyed the webinar. Thanks for attending.